Good morning. On behalf of the College of Business Administration Alumni Association, I'd like to welcome you to the 1995 Oklahoma Business Conference. Uh, my name is Paul Jaco, and I'm this year's president of the Alumni Association, and I uh, also have a second job with the J.C. Penney Company uh, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, before we begin uh, this morning's uh, program, I'd like to call your attention to the three by five cards that are in your chairs and their purpose. Uh, our speaker, Mr. Crandall, has agreed to take questions from the audience at the conclusion of his talk and to get those questions to him, if you would write them down on that card and then pass them to the aisles where volunteers will pick those up and bring them to Chris Bayuth, who's, uh, raise your hand, Chris, uh, down here also with the Alumni Association, who will then uh, uh, ask uh, the questions of Mr. Crandall uh, when the appropriate time comes. Uh, moving on with the program, uh, Rick Kozier came to the University of Oklahoma uh, almost four years ago to become the sixth dean of the College of Business Administration. Uh, dean Kozier brought with him a lot of ideas, such as this business conference, and real vision for academic excellence. And as an alum, it's been a real rewarding uh, the last couple of years being involved with the business school and his vision uh, here in the business school. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, to you uh, Dean Kozier. Dean Kozier. Thank you, Paul. Uh, can we have the volunteers who are picking up the cards raise their hands, too, so you can see who they are? People with hands up, those are going to be the card collectors uh, with your questions. Uh, this really is a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, Paul used the term vision. Uh, when I did arrive, and it's been about three years, not four, Paul. It must be, it seems like uh, it's been longer than it has been. But uh, it was a vision to have a, a successful business conference. This is our third, and we're really pleased that you're here and with the success we've had, including today, which is a terrific uh, conference. It's, it's, uh, before I introduce uh, our, the next uh, speaker or introducer, uh, let me uh, point out that we do have the chairman of the OU Board of Regents with us in the front row, Mr. G.T. Blankenship, down here, G.T. And I, we have other regents with us. I will introduce all of the Board of Regents well, at the state and OU at the luncheon today, and we're pleased to have all of you with us. Uh, there's no doubt that on campus at the University of Oklahoma these days, there's an air of excitement. If you've been down to Norman, if you've been on campus, there's just a feeling of progress and that things are extremely uh, uh, good. They're going in the right direction. And frankly, uh, that is due to our leader, uh, individual who's been with us now a little less than a year, but has had a tremendous impact on the university and the College of Business. Uh, this individual uh, was governor of the, of the university, governor of the state of Oklahoma from 1975 to 1979. Uh, from 1979 to 1994, he was the U.S. Senator from the state of Oklahoma, accomplished much, was very influential on several key committees, Chairman of the uh, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. As some people have said that Committee on Intelligence was a good lead-in to a university job. Uh, he served uh, on, since 1988 on the Yale University Board of Trustees. Uh, he's uh, ma married to Molly Shyborn, who is a former judge and English teacher. He's the 13th president of the University of Oklahoma. It's my great pleasure to introduce David L. Boren. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Rick talked about the Intelligence Committee. I won't tell him what most people say about the Senate having an Intelligence Committee. They say it's a contradiction in terms, the idea that the Senate could have an Intelligence Committee. But I was uh, back up to speak to that, to my old committee the other day. And when I got through, one of the reporters uh, came up to me and said, do you miss being where the action is? And I said, well, as usual, you people in Washington just don't get it. Uh, I am where the action is, and you're not. And in many ways, I think that this conference represents exactly that principle. Uh, we're here to talk today about the economic development of our state. We're here to talk about the economic development of our communities and our regions. 
And I'm absolutely convinced that the kind of partnership that is represented in this gathering today, bringing together the talent from the private community, the private sector, the business leadership of our state and nation and region, uh, together within a partnership with our higher education community to talk about what we need to do and what we can do together, is exactly the way in which our country is going to be revitalized. It is not going to be revitalized by the top from the top down, by a small number of people sitting in Washington with all the answers and then directing us, whether it's in terms of economic policy or social policy or health policy or criminal justice policy, progress and revitalization in our country is going to come from all of us pooling our talents, pooling our abilities, particularly at the local level and at the state level, and particularly with public and private partnerships to get the job done. So it's exciting to be a part of a process like this today and to share ideas, to hear stimulating speakers. And we're very, very fortunate to have such an outstanding group of people. And I want to thank each one of them for participating. I know that uh, later on today, you're going to have my friend and former colleague, uh, Ambassador Jim Jones, talk about opportunities for our region, particularly as they relate to the growing economic ties that we will have through NAFTA and the changing economic situation with all of Latin America and the opportunities that that represents. We're very privileged to have our keynote speaker this morning and, and the many panelists who will be with us through the day and all of you who will add your own ideas and your own discussion to the process through which we will be passing today. There's been noted that there's a direct relationship between the economic development of an area and what happens in the area of higher education. In fact, there has been now a national study released which traces per capita income and also puts beside it in a matrix the number of years of higher education per capita that people in a particular state have. And we have found that there's almost an exact correlation between the strength of the educational system, between the number of years of advanced training and higher education that people in a state receive and the per capita income level of people in that particular area. And that's why we are anxious to be a partner with you in the economic development of our state. That's why we're very, very proud that we're creating a center of excellence because we realize that we're teaching those who will be making fundamental decisions about where our country is headed, particularly as more decisions are going to be made at the state and local level. More decisions are going to be made in the private sector. More programs are going to be carried out by private organizations, not only corporations acting responsibly to solve social problems, but also private charitable organizations that need to know how to improve their management skills if we're to have the kind of society we want in the future. And that's why we're proud to be building our Honors College. It's why we're proud to have the number one ranking in the United States among public universities and the number of merit scholars and national scholars enroll. Uh, it is why we're extremely proud of the fact that this year we made history at the University of Oklahoma, state history, because for the first time, we broke the $100 million mark in terms of receipt of outside research and training grants to the faculty of the University of Oklahoma. That is quite a record. And let me say, to put it in perspective, our faculty, which is smaller than it was 10 years ago, earned $103 million in external research grants and training grants, bringing those funds into the university and into the state, causing an economic spinoff last year. And the entire state appropriation for the University of Oklahoma last year was only $140 million. So it shows you what our people are doing in partnership, in partnership with the private sector to really make an economic contribution to our state. We are now in the process of putting into action a private research corporation, the University of Oklahoma Research Corporation, that will work with the university to take the ideas, to take the patents, to take the developments, to take the product of research and put it directly in place to create economic growth in our region. And so we're extremely proud of the things going on at the university. Last week, we picked up our 701st with Archie Dunham, a CEO produced by the University of Oklahoma, and that continues our record as being in the top 10 universities, public or private, in the entire nation in the production of CEOs of major corporations in our country. And I would say, and Rick Kozer was a little modest about his leadership, the U.S. News just came out with a report last week which ranks our undergraduate business education programs in the top 20% of the nation, a grade A on a five-point scale, and uh, you haven't seen anything yet in terms of what we intend to accomplish in terms of excellence 
in the area of business education, our undergraduate programs, and our graduate programs as well. And we're ready. We're ready for the challenge. I know you'll hear from Ambassador Jones and others to be involved internationally. Our goal is to make sure that every one of our students, ultimately every MBA that we produce, or every engineer or lawyer and undergraduates, when they finish the University of Oklahoma, will finish not only with a skill, but they will also finish with a knowledge of another language and another culture so that they will be able to go out and, and be active in the international marketplace and do business in any part of the world. We want to be the first public university that achieves that kind of comprehensive education for the future to enable our students, our state, and our region to really be ready for the international competition which we already face. This morning we are especially privileged to have as our keynote speaker for the morning session a truly remarkable business leader. I have had the privilege over the last several months of becoming his colleague at American Airlines as, with the privilege of serving as a member of the board of directors, watching him, watching his creativity as a business leader, uh, watching the decisiveness with which he is able to move has uh, really been a wonderful learning experience for me. He uh, became chairman and chief executive officer of AMR Corporation and American Airlines on March 1st, 1985, and president of both companies in 1980. He's been a member of the American's board of directors since 1976. He uh, started out in another part of the country. He was born in uh, Westerly, Rhode Island, and in 1957 he graduated from the University of Rhode Island and received a master's degree in business administration later from the University of uh, Pennsylvania's uh, Wharton School uh, in 1960. He's been active in all kinds of civic work. He serves on the board of directors of Halliburton Corporation in Dallas. He's a director of the Chicago Lyric Opera. He's an active member of the Business Roundtable. Uh, he has been uh, recognized uh, by many national publications for his achievements and his executive leadership, including Business Week and Industry Week, uh, many others. In March of 1995, the Frontiers of Flight Museum uh, bestowed on him the George Hathaway Award for Achievement in Aviation. He really has worked his way up through the ranks at American Airlines. In 1973, he uh, served as Senior Vice President of Finance, has a very strong background in that area. In 1974, he really switched gears and, and uh, began to head America's marketing organization as Senior Vice President for Marketing. And he remained in that position until his elevation to the presidency in 1980. As America's, American's top marketing executive, and subsequently as the airline's president and chairman, he has participated in developing many innovations uh, which really have impacted not only American but the entire aviation industry. These include the idea of super saver fares, America's saber automation system, in many ways turning businesses that were necessary in terms of services that American had to provide itself and making them independent businesses that could serve other companies as well. The Advantage program for frequent uh, travelers, the creation of a system of major hubs, and uh, the wide-ranging international route system uh, for American. As all of you know, American is one of the three largest employers in the state of Oklahoma uh, with our maintenance uh, operations in the state. And again, that's another example of turning a business, a service for American itself, into a business as American provides maintenance not only on its own aircraft, but on aircraft of many other companies. And that has helped maintain the employment base in the state of Oklahoma that that maintenance center has been turned into a business itself to serve and provide service for others. So I am very proud to present to you this morning as our morning keynote speaker, a person who is much involved in Oklahoma, a person whose creativity as a business leader is something from which we can all learn as we look for ways to economically develop our state and region. Mr. Robert Crandall. Now we've got the lights up. You got it done. Look at that. Well, thank you, David, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It, it's always a pleasure to be in Oklahoma. All of us think of Oklahoma rather as a home away from home, 
As uh, some of you know, and as David mentioned, we have about 10,000 people in Oklahoma, more than anywhere else on the system except Texas, and we have the largest private payroll in the state. And of course, we are very pleased that David Boren, who I want to thank for that very generous introduction, also serves as a member of our board. It's particularly nice to be part of this meeting at a time when the news about our business is better than it has been for some years. Although our earnings in 1995 will be modest as a percentage of our huge investment base, profits of any size are preferable to the losses of the last few years, and I'm pleased to say that the outlook for 1996 is that it, too, will be a decent year. Despite the fact that the numbers are better than they have been in recent years, they are not very good by the standards of American industry overall. And our business practices continue to be mystifying to many of our customers. There was a great story in the papers out in Denver the other day about a family that lives very close to the new Denver airport. And they wanted to take a trip to Washington, the nation's capital. So they drove 67 miles in the other direction over to Colorado Springs, and they got on an airplane which flew from Colorado Springs back to the Denver airport and then on to Washington. And they paid $1,144 less to fly from Colorado Springs to Denver to Washington than they would have had they simply driven over to the airport and gotten on the airplane and flown to Washington. Now, let me assure you that I understand the relevant pricing theory behind that precisely. <laughs> As do all of my colleagues in the airline business. But the general public does not. And that explains, I think, both the newsworthiness of the article and the rather quizzical looks that I get from people outside the airline business when I discuss such things. Now, those of us in aviation like to point out when we talk about this maddening business that it is very complicated. And when we do, we hope that will explain both our obvious inability to master it well enough to turn a satisfactory profit and the many inexplicable things that our customers encounter when they deal with us. And sometimes that approach works. And sometimes, particularly in Texas, people just pat me on the shoulder and suggest that our business must be run by Aggies. <laughs> now, as I'm sure most of you know, Aggie is our name for folks who went to school at Texas A&M. Now, folks in Oklahoma have heard lots of different things about Aggies, but the reality is that Aggies have played and are playing a major role in Texas, and they're a mighty proud group. At the same time, they are fodder for a good deal of Texas humor, which reminds me of the story I heard recently about an Aggie who was so beset by financial woes that all else failing, he turned to the desperate measure of kidnapping. And he drove over to one of the state's most exclusive private schools, to which he knew many Aggie alumni sent their kids. And as the students left for the day, he grabbed one, and he pulled the boy into the car, assured him that he wouldn't be hurt if he played ball, and then wrote the following ransom note to the victim's parents. He says, I'm not a bad person. I'm just an Aggie down on my luck. I won't harm your boy, but if you want to see him again, put $10,000 in the paper sack and leave it under the big oak tree in front of the school at noon tomorrow. Folded the note up, gave it to the kid, asked him to hand it to his parents, and dropped him off in front of his house. The next day, right at noon, he went to the oak tree, and there, sure enough, was a paper sack with $10,000 in cash. <laughs> and a note which said, here's your ransom money. I can't believe you'd do a, th a thing like this to a fellow Aggie. <laughs> well, whether, whether commercial aviation really is as complex as we'd like to think, or whether those of us who run the business are simply as unable to see solutions as that hapless Aggie isn't clear. Nonetheless, we are doing all we can to preserve and extend the financial recovery we are experiencing. And we are reaching out for help whenever we can find it. Now, in recent years, Oklahoma has taken a number of steps to provide the kind of favorable business climate which is the focus of this conference. One of the things the state has done is create the Oklahoma Quality Jobs Program. 
which provides financial incentives for large manufacturers and industrial and engineering companies to create new jobs within the state. That program, together with our improved results and a new labor contract between American and our mechanics, which incorporates some very important productivity improvements, has enabled us to launch a recall of 400 or so mechanics that we've had on furlough for some time and to start the process of creating the new jobs we all want to see here. Most of those jobs are at our maintenance and engineering center in Tulsa, where we have invested nearly half a billion dollars during the last six years. Today, it is the world's premier aircraft maintenance operation, bar none. Now, in addition to working on our own aircraft, as David mentioned, we are using that facility to build a growing contract maintenance business. And if you tour our Tulsa base these days, you'll see airplanes with American Airlines and Federal Express and Reno Air on their tails. And with a little luck, we're going to have more maintenance customers in the years to come. Now, all of that, the development of all that business has been greatly facilitated by the state's recently enacted sales tax exemption on aircraft parts, which went a very long way towards making it possible for us to attract those maintenance customers. And I also want to thank Governor Keating for his support of our efforts to bring in military business targeted for outsourcing. Among other things, he has been instrumental in getting some talks started between General Eichmann and his folks over at Tinker Air Force Base and Dave Cruz, who is our head maintenance guy in Tulsa. It is very clear that the Air Force wants to build a more efficient maintenance operation and recognizes, recognizes that doing so means using commercial providers. Well, we are ready, willing, and able, and we are determined to get some of that business for ourselves and for Oklahoma. The governor has even tried to rustle up some interest at Southwest Airlines. Now, since Southwest flies 737s and we don't, we probably will not get the airframe work. But we are in hot pursuit of Southwest engine overhaul business because we think we can provide better engine maintenance value <clears throat> than anyone else around. And once again, we are going to do all we can to get that work to Oklahoma. Now, obviously, neither the state government nor the federal government can solve all of our or any other businesses' problems. And as a consequence, we've been hard at work trying to help ourselves. Among other things, we have been adding to our extensive network in Latin America, adding service from DFW to Sao Paulo and from Miami to Maracaibo. We've been rounding out our European network by adding various services <coughs> between Chicago and Birmingham, England, between Kennedy and Manchester, between Miami and Frankfurt. We have taken advantage of a new Open Skies Agreement with Canada to add lots of new service from the United States to various Canadian cities. We have recently done a couple of deals with Federal Express, which you may have read about. One to sell them our MD-11s, which makes room at the top of the fleet for the much more capable, longer-range aircraft we hope to have sometime in the future. And the other to do the maintenance work I've already mentioned. And finally, we recently managed to persuade the Congress, or at least we think we did, not to hit us with a fuel tax, at least for the time being. And we've made some progress <coughs> towards getting our costs down. By means of negotiating the new mechanics contract I've already mentioned, by chopping more than $90 million a year out of our headquarters cost, by restructuring our field service operations, by streamlining our food services, and by making a thousand other changes. And while that progress is good news, some of the changes we've had to make are not universally applauded. One of them is substituting turboprops for jets on some flights, including some of those between Oklahoma City and our hub in DFW. Now, to be quite frank, we would rather offer all of our customers jet service. But the fact that we are a high-cost airline makes that impossible. Where our jets lose money, we have no choice but to substitute aircraft that will better match our costs to the revenues available. In one way or another, we have got to find ways to make AMR pro more profitable than it has been. For only a satisfactorily profitable company can make the truly enormous investments 
needed to be successful in the airline business. <clears throat> and since we are kind of linked together, Oklahoma and ourselves, let me mention just quickly the magnitude of those investments. We operate about 625 airplanes, and they wear out in about 20 years. And a new airplane costs 30 to $35 million on the average. So just to keep our company the size that it is today, we've got to buy about 30 new airplanes at an average price of 30 to $35 million every year. And if we want to grow, which is certainly in your interest and in ours, that means another 30 airplanes, if you assume 5% growth. And if you tag on a couple of hundred million dollars a year for computers, the ongoing average annual capital cost of sustaining American Airlines is about $2 billion a year. That's an awfully big number and requires very consistent profitability. And one of the many things <coughs> that we have done in our quest to meet the goal of more consistent profitability is to big, build a very big, very successful real-time travel information system that we call SABRE. That system <clears throat> which is, as far as we know, the largest online computer system in non-governmental hands anywhere in the world, is housed in Tulsa, in an underground, completely secure computer center, which is also the largest structure dedicated to computer operations in the state of Oklahoma. And as airline, as automation changes airline distribution systems, and the nature of the interface between travelers and the air transport system, the technology side of our business is going to change rapidly and grow fast. The world's airlines are moving very rapidly towards an integrated worldwide system of interconnected computers that will make all of the documents that our customers now need to carry around, tickets and manifests, etc., unnecessary. Tomorrow's passengers will simply give us an identifier, perhaps a name on a smart chip perhaps a number swiped from a magnetic strip, perhaps even a signature, a palm print, or a retina reading. Really, nobody knows the details. What we do know is that we'll be able to use that identifier to trigger electronic recognition of your right to our services. One of the other ventures we have gotten into as a byproduct of this distribution revolution is the fast-growing call solutions business. And we have a telemarketing facility right here in Oklahoma City <coughs> that employs upwards of 500 people, and we hope that number will be a lot bigger in the years ahead. We are also involved in a very exciting joint venture with OU's Center for Analysis and Prediction of Storms, which is doing some tremendously interesting work with weather predicting models. And if they are as good as we think they are, those models will be able to provide very accurate short-term forecasts for relatively small areas, like airports. After a massive hailstorm at DFW, and you may have read about this in the newspaper, we got a hailstorm that came right across the DFW airport last spring and put about 10% of our fleet out of commission. We took the data that was available a couple of hours before that storm and put it into the OU models, and sure enough, the models predicted exactly what actually happened. So we are quite excited about that work. And if our testing is successful, we plan to package those models as proprietary products and sell their output to other airlines and farmers and event promoters and others who need very localized and very accurate weather data. In short, we are doing all that we can to improve our business by controlling costs, using our assets efficiently, opening new lines of business, and investing in the future. But we cannot change the fundamentals of the airline industry, which is and will remain our major business. To be successful in commercial aviation, we need the support not only of the Oklahoma state government, which we have had, but also in certain areas, the support of the federal government as well. And I think this underscores a point that David Bourne touched on in his opening remarks, and that is that as our business and other businesses becomes more global, the interaction between private enterprise and state government and the federal government will be more and more important. Probably the greatest challenge that the government needs to meet 
is to do a better job of managing the air traffic control system. Back in 1978, the federal government deregulated the U.S. airline industry. But since that time, the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, has failed to modernize the ATC system to keep pace with the rapid growth of that deregulated industry. And now, as you all know from frequent headlines, those chickens are coming home to roost as antiquated computers and inadequate planning combine to cause system breakdowns and to impose lots more delay on you and our other customers than you ought to have to tolerate. After many years of trying, both houses of Congress have now formulated bills which, if passed, will free the FAA from some of the government's more restrictive personnel and equipment acquisition rules and will ensure that the government gets the use of the excise taxes that you and our other passengers and shippers pay every time you use our services. For years, those funds have been diverted to hold down the federal, budget, the, the federal budget deficit. It is time they were used for their intended purposes. We hope those bills will work their way through the two houses soon, and that before the year is out, we will see legislation which will produce hopefully in the not-too-distant future, dramatic changes in the air traffic control system. Another area in which we need the government's support is in maximizing our international market opportunities. When you compare U.S. flag airlines to foreign flag carriers, U.S. airlines are low-cost operators, and given an, an opportunity, can compete very successfully in world markets. Unfortunately, we are unable to fly most of the international routes we'd like to fly. Now, I spent last week in Washington lobbying and speechifying about why we ought to have more routes to Asia, and it wasn't just an occasional visit. I have been spending lots of time there in recent years trying to help our legislators and their staffs and other policymakers understand both the importance of international aviation to our nation's balance of trade and the glaring inequities that constrain the ability of U.S. carriers to compete in international markets. Let me give you just two examples. As a practical matter, Japan is the gateway to Asia. For reasons of geography and politics, if you don't fly to Japan, you really can't serve Asia. Unfortunately, our service to Japan is limited to flights from only three U.S. cities. And in another part of the world, despite the fact that we fly more trips to both the United Kingdom and to Europe than any other airline, the U.S. government has refused to insist that we be permitted to serve London's Heathrow Airport from DFW. Now, at this point, I suspect that some of you may be wondering why I am talking to business people in Oklahoma about such federal, federally controlled matters as the ATC system and route rights to Japan and the United Kingdom. The reason, ladies and gentlemen, is very simple. We cannot solve those problems by ourselves. Only the United States government can modernize the air traffic control system, and only the U.S. government can get us the international route rights we need. And the U.S. government is your government as well as mine. To persuade that government to act, we need the support of everyone who has access to our nation's policymakers. You have it, and we need your help. As we grow, both internationally and domestically, we will provide more jobs and create more wealth right here in Oklahoma. And if we do not grow, all of us are going to do less well than any of us would prefer. Now, over the years, Oklahoma has been very good to America, and I've mentioned this morning a couple of recent things the state has done. There have been many, many more in the past. I think it is fair to say that we have also been good for Oklahoma. If you sustain your efforts to build a competitive business environment, and if we succeed in getting the federal government to act affirmatively, we ought to prosper together in the years ahead, and I hope we will do just that. Thank you very much. Now, as, as your program chairman mentioned, we've got some time for questions.
questions and answers. I can't see you very well, but I can, now that the house lights are up, I can see a little better. And I gather there are some cards out there, and we've got somebody down here with a mic, so we'll start with him, and then if anybody wants to go on from there, we'll do that too. Yes, Mr. Crandall. The first question, please explain the reasoning for ceasing jet service to cities like Oklahoma City and instituting commuter service. We lose money on jets, very simple. The, uh, the uh, service that we operated between Oklahoma City and, and DFW uh, is, is there for two purposes, but its primary purpose is to feed traffic through the hub. In effect, service from a spoke city like Oklahoma City to a hub offers connections both to domestic cities east and west of DFW and to cities around the world, including Europe and Latin America. So the folks who are going from Oklahoma City down to DFW, for the most part, are going through the hub. About 30% are probably going to Dallas. The other 70% are thereabouts are going through. In order to make that useful, we have to operate multiple flights per day. And, and today we operate uh, either 16 or 17 flights a day, and we will continue to operate 15, 16, 17, very high frequency between Oklahoma City and DFW, thus giving the traveler opportunity an opportunity to go at, at about the time they'd like to go. That's a very short flight. As a matter of fact, the elapsed time in the schedule with a turboprop and a jet are exactly the same. Now, people would prefer to fly in jets because they are bigger and they fly higher and they don't bump around quite so much. But the fact is that modern turboprop airplanes are much different than the turboprops of the past, and the number of people on any one of those many frequencies is relatively small. As a high-cost operator, and we are a high-cost operator, we simply can't continue to fly jets across very short stage lengths. And as a consequence, we have two choices. We can either discontinue service to Oklahoma City altogether, or we can operate high-frequency turboprop services, and that's what we've chosen to do. So we'll have to see what the marketplace does with that decision. But uh, I think you will find, as you use those uh, airplanes, as I hope you will, that they are quite a, quite a good deal more satisfactory than some of the turboprop commuter airplanes you've been used to in the past. Please explain why it seems that where Southwest services occur, the rates of all other airlines appear to be lower. Southwest costs are vastly lower than ours are, and our prices have nothing to do with our costs. In other words, it's absolutely true, and I suspect it's true for most of your businesses as well. Costs are set, and prices are set by the marketplace, not by costs. So if somebody's going to fly between point A and B for $29 or $39 or $49 or $89, that's the price we're going to have to charge or we're going to see all of the traffic go with the person that sets the lower price. So the marketplace sets the prices, and our task is to try and get our costs to the point where, where given that level of revenue, we can make a profit. Uh, up to this point, we've not been able to do that. The, the major airlines of this country, United, Delta, and America, have vastly higher labor costs than many other carriers. We have vastly higher labor costs than Southwest. If, for example, our labor cost per available seat mile, which is the fundamental measure of capacity, were the same as Southwest, our pre-tax profits would rise by $1 billion, $100 million annually. That's the labor cost difference between us and Southwest. The difference between us and Continental is $1.7 billion annually. So, so long as our costs are higher than theirs, we must do one of two things. We either match those prices and lose a little money because we are better off operating than not operating, or we withdraw from that, that particular marketplace. Bankruptcy appears to offer an unfair advantage to ailing airlines. Is there any move to change the laws specifically related to airlines? Well, there's, um, the bankruptcy does, in fact, offer unfair advantages in the sense that a, that company Failing to, failing to meet its financial obligations goes into bankruptcy and simply hives off or discards very substantial amounts of debt. Continental has done that twice. TWA, I think, has done it three times. And, of course, they continue to operate. And having gotten rid of the debt, 
They then return to a non-bankruptcy state with a very substantial cost advantage relative to carriers like our own. Uh, un uh, the, we, many of us in the industry, and, and I myself, have made a very substantial effort to get Congress to amend that law. Unfortunately, the Congress is unwilling to do so. From a political perspective, uh, I think what you find is that people are more concerned about preserving the jobs of a company by allowing it to continue uh, to continue uh, to operate rather than establishing a level playing field. The difficulty is this. If you look at the United States of America relative to all the other countries of the world, what you'll find is that the commercial airlines of this country are operating one of the oldest fleets of airplanes in the world. Now, in the long run, unless the United States has a commercial airline industry that can earn enough to justify the very substantial capital investments I mentioned somewhere in the course of my remarks, then the commercial airline industry in this country isn't going to be able to compete satisfactorily abroad. So I certainly have an interest on behalf of my shareholders, and I think you have an interest as citizens in the question of whether or not we have established the right infrastructure to allow cost-efficient producers within the United States to compete with airlines abroad. In recent years, that's not been true. I'll give you a very interesting statistic. In all the years since Orville and Wilbur invented the airplane, through the end of last year, the cumulative earnings of the U.S. commercial airline industry have been a negative $5 billion. There's an old joke in the industry that things in this business are so bad that if Orville and Wilbur had both stayed in, one would have had to lay the other off. In hindsight, was deregulation good for the American Airlines? Uh, it's been good for American Airlines because we have we changed more rapidly than some of our, some of our brethren. Uh, whether it had, and I think deregulation, frankly, is, is uh, on the whole uh, good for the country. I do not think that the U.S. government did a very good job of adopting an integrated set of policies at the time they deregulated the business. So they deregulated the business that didn't change the bankruptcy laws. They didn't update the ATC system. They didn't do a variety of other things that would have made it possible for a deregulated industry to shape itself in accordance with the dictates of the marketplace. And that's the reason that some U.S. airlines, indeed almost every U.S. airline, has had a very difficult time financially in recent years. Given that fuel is one of your largest costs, are you concerned about the U.S.'s rising reliance on foreign oil? Yes and no. Uh, I, yes, I think, I think every U.S. citizen, uh, particularly given the experience of the, of the uh, of very rapidly rising prices and, and a shortfall some years ago, is concerned about our dependence on foreign oil. On the other hand, there's, and those, there are people in this audience that know a lot more about the oil business than I do, but the emergence of better technology means that, that more and more oil has been dis is, is being discovered. And there was quite an interesting article uh, in, in uh, this morning's newspapers that had to do with the probability of what would happen to oil prices if the, uh, if the cartel, if OPEC, went away. And the forecast was that they'd drop to about $14 a barrel. So there does not seem to be, in the world as we know it today, uh, any great uh, any great threat, and therefore it is not something that we are greatly concerned about. Do you feel the U.S. federal government is the toughest regulatory environment in which to run a major corporation? If so, how can that be improved? Oh, boy. I, we should call on David Boren for remarks. That's there. <laughs> well, the, is the U.S. government, uh, is, 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 the US, does, is the United States a difficult environment in which to run a major business? Yes. It is a difficult environment, and in some respects, much more difficult than other environments, and that's why you see at least a limited number of U.S. corporations going offshore. The principal areas involved there are taxation, and, and U.S. taxation is relatively high, and, and a lot of regulation, which many, which many foreign governments don't uh, impose, and, and, and some of our foreign competitors thus don't have to comply with. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, the United States remains, in many respects, the most open competitive environment anywhere in the world. And in that sense, if you, if you believe in the power of the free market, which I do, 
the United States is still a pretty good place to run a business for all of our problems. In recent years, the Sabre Group has been one of Americans' best assets. What future plans does American have to further develop this asset? Well, we're working very hard on that. There's an interesting article in the current issue of Business Week, the, the one that came out two, three days ago, having to do with Sabre and all of our plans to try and adopt Sabre. Sabre, up to this point, has been essentially a wholesale system, in effect, a system that delivers information to a sales intermediate. So travel agents all over the country and all over the world use Sabre to sell airline tickets and provide airline-related and travel-related information to the, to, uh, to, uh, the end customer. As most of you are well aware, communication technology and computing technology has changed so rapidly that the Internet and the private, uh, the private data service and a whole variety of, of uh, other tools are now out there where individuals are beginning to tap directly into things like Sabre. And the consequence is we've got a system called Easy Saber, which has some two million individual members. We expect that to, go, to grow very rapidly. We expect the Internet to be a mechanism by which we can interface directly with our passengers. So we are investing a lot of money, hiring a lot of people, investing a lot of money to adopt Saber, to make it more of a retail vehicle and less of a wholesale vehicle. Now, I expect that travel agents will be a, an important part of the distribution system of our business for a long time to come. I also expect that Sabre, that many of our individual customers will be interacting directly with Sabre. And that's our challenge. Our challenge is to make Sabre more attractive both to travel agent users and to individual users and to corporate users than any other source of that same information. There are a number of so-called computerized reservation systems out there that compete with Sabre, our task is to make Sabre the best of the lot. Explain the seat allocation of your frequent flyer program. It seems very limited. It is limited. It is, it is well, what we do, quite frankly, we, 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 of course, we allocate all the seats on all our airplanes. Now, if you're, if you're a, uh, an Advantage member, and I hope all of you are, if you want, I have some applications with me. <laughs> if you're an Advantage member and you want, you can have any seat on any airplane, on any flight, on the system any day you want it. But you have to pay more miles for it than uh, if you want, than, than you do, than you do if you are willing to accept a, a, a lower priced that is, a seat you can buy for fewer miles, and those seats are allocated. And of course, our objective is not to allocate to the, to the lower-priced advantage seats any seats that could be sold for an amount of money which has more value than the advantage miles that are being cashed in. So there are seats available on virtually every, on every flight. The number of those seats that's available is a direct reflection of how many of those seats we think we can sell to, to passengers who are using money as opposed to Advantage Miles. We don't regard Advantage Miles as free travel. That is a, a currency that our frequent customers have earned. But we value that currency relative to amounts of money. So in the same sense that we, we aren't willing to sell every seat on the 5 p.m. airplane between DFW and LaGuardia at a discount price, because since there is high demand by business travelers on that flight, we're going to save most of the seats for people that will pay 900 bucks. On the other hand, if you want to fly Wednesday afternoon at 1 o'clock, we got plenty of seats for 300 bucks. And, and similarly, on Wednesday afternoon at 1 o'clock, it is easier to get one of the lower-priced advantage seats than it is on the 5 o'clock airplane between DFW and LaGuardia. So we simply, the rationing process, which we call yield management in the business, is nothing more, nothing less than taking all of the seats on all of the flights that we operate and putting them into tiers and doing our best to sell each seat for the maximum number of dollars that anybody will pay for that seat at that moment in time. It's a pure auction market. And sometimes we win and sometimes you win. 
When can we as Oklahoma City citizens expect to get jet service restored by American Airlines? <laughs> to DFW? Well, if the, if the question is to DFW, I, I suspect the answer is uh, that, that that is improbable. That unless our costs decline dramatically, that it is unlikely that we will restore jet service to DFW simply because, as I mentioned before, the, the, uh, those flights have yielded unsatisfactory financial results. What effect do you see business meetings by computer, telephone, and video having on the airline system? Very interesting question, and I, none of us know the answer to that, but we are not as worried about it as you might suspect. If you look at the whole history of communications, the development of communication systems, every time communications gets better, travel increases. Oddly enough, as you get to know the person on the other end of the communication linkage better, you are more and more anxious to actually physically see that person. So as telephone systems, got, have, have, today's telephone systems obviously are a far cry from those of 20 years ago, and, and video conferencing, for, for example, is much more widely used today than it was five years ago. Neither of those developments to, to date have resulted in any meaningful substitution. It's sort of like computers, you know, when computers were first invented, people said, gee, it's going to put everybody out of work because we can do the work we're doing today with far fewer people if we have computers. And the answer, if that's the way it had been, that would have been the impact, but that isn't what's happened. What we now do with computers is we develop vastly more data and vastly more knowledge than we ever had before. So we've taken the benefit of computerization and turned it into better information and greater wisdom, rather than turning it into fewer jobs at the same level of knowledge. I suspect you're going to see the same thing with respect to improved communications relative to business travel. So we are not terribly worried about it, but it is one of those things we watch very carefully. Most companies profess great value for employees, but in reality, corporate execs really only value what employees can do, not the employees themselves. In the age of corporate downsizing at American Airlines, how do you approach valuing your employees? Hmm. Well, uh, that's one of those uh, questions that I suppose one should answer in a political way. Uh, let me try an honest answer. Uh, <laughs> the, the reality, I think, of that is this, that, that corporations are artificial beings. And as such, an artificial beings don't value other beings. Now, those artificial beings are run by people. And people value other people. So the fact is, when, when American Airlines or GT&E, GTE, or anybody else has to downsize, when we have to eliminate the number of people that work for us because it is essential that we get our costs down, we do that because if we don't do it, the corporation simply won't exist. And if the corporation doesn't exist, many c categories of our constituencies, constituents will be, will be damaged all of the thousands of men and women across the company whose pension funds are invested in AMR stock or GTE stock will be damaged because that corporation will have less value. All the communities served will be damaged because that corporation isn't profitable and can't make the kind of capital investments it needs to make and so forth. Now along the way, as the downsizing occurs, employees will be damaged. The corporation doesn't care about that, but I do. And the people who actually have to do the downsizing care and don't like it at all. So the fact of the matter is that when downsizing occurs, people have to do their duty. We have to do our duty to the corporation. That doesn't mean that we don't have any feeling for or that we don't value the people who have to be downsized. We value them as individuals. But the corporation cannot value people for anything other than what they actually do. So that's the way the world is. Yeah. 
For the last question, sir, what would it take from Oklahoma to establish direct flights to each coast? More people. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of uh, interest, obviously, in both Tulsa and Oklahoma City about nonstop service to the West Coast, to the East Coast. And, and, and years ago, when the Civil Aeronautics Board dictated the airline system of the United States, there was nonstop service. And there could be nonstop service today. So one answer is more people. That is, if the cities were bigger, if those cities were bigger and there were more demand, the marketplace would create that service. Now, there's another way, and that is you can go back to regulating the airline business. And if I was going to regulate the airline business and you asked me how to produce produce nonstop service to the West Coast and the East Coast, I would tell you discontinue service to DFW. That is, instead of having 15 flights a day to DFW, only have three. And that, that means that, mo that more of the people who want to go to New York and to the West Coast won't go by way of DFW. I mean, right after, right after uh, deregulation occurred, Birmingham, Alabama used to have a nonstop flight to Los Angeles. Right after deregulation occurred, we went into Birmingham and we started five flights a day to DFW. United went into Birmingham and started five flights a day to Chicago. TWA went into Birmingham and started five flights a day to St. Louis, and so forth. So Birmingham had lots more service, which means that people in Birmingham who wanted to go to Los Angeles had 25 or 30 options in the course of the day to get to Los Angeles by way of one hub or the other. The result is that the nonstop service to Birmingham, which, you start, which operated in the regulated environment at a 55, 60% load factor, simply dried up and went away because there were only 15 or 20 people that chose to wait for the nonstop service. So the answer to the question really is this, that the marketplace, our customers, all of you, don't want nonstop service badly enough to wait to take that service in lieu of a flight that goes by way of one of the hubs at a preferable time. When I talk to people in groups like this, people often, somebody says, why don't you put more space between the seats? The answer is because you don't want more space between the seats. Because if you did, people would configure airplanes with more space between the seats, and you would refuse to ride on El Scruncho Airline in favor of the airline with more space between the seats. But that isn't the way the marketplace has worked out. People would rather go on El Scruncho right, at a time that is convenient for them and pay a lower price. So what you're seeing in operation here is the closest thing to a perfect market system that I know of. If you want to, my wife bought me some undershirts yesterday. She drove around to various places and she finally bought three undershirts for $9.99. And she's, in the course of her journey, she was in a department store, saw exactly the same package of three undershirts for 18 bucks. Now that department store sells a lot of those undershirts. Why? Because, this, because if my wife had been able to, she'd have turned on her computer at home, and she'd have keyed in undershirts. And the screen would have shown what each store in town was selling those undershirts for, and she'd have called them up and ordered them. And that's what you do with an airline ticket. So in a perfect marketplace, prices will always be the same. And in the airline marketplace, that's why our prices are always the same as the other guys, because everybody has perfect information about what the prices are. But in the undershirt business, you can't find out what the other guy's selling undershirts for unless you want to drive around and find out. And that's really one of the things that is terrifying the undershirt guys because we're starting... <laughs> one of the things we're starting thinking about doing with Sabre is, is beginning to build catalogs. So if you want to buy, you know, some work boots, you can, you can call up work boots and you see what L.L. Bean's got and you see what everybody's got, and the retailers are terrified. So we got better, you know, better things, better things lie ahead, cheaper undershirts and other versions. <laughs>
Francisco. We really appreciate your being here with us today. We know how busy your schedule is, and as a token of appreciation, we have this Remington uh, statue of Outlaw from the Cowboy Hall of Fame, and we'd like to take that home and hopefully have it on your desk or in the terrific. office. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I think it's pretty clear that Mr. Crandall is direct. Uh, refreshingly candid and an extremely competent CEO and we're fortunate to have him with us. Uh, the President and Mr. Crandall do have to catch an American flight uh, <laughs> shortly so they're going to have to leave now so uh, again thank you very much. <clears throat> and we have a break coming up. Uh, it'll uh, last about 20 minutes. We'll be back in here for a terrific uh, mayor's panel talking about uh, the economies of their cities and Oklahoma City in particular, Tulsa. So be with us. Uh, be ready to go about 10.30 back here. We look forward to reconvening. Good morning again, and welcome to our mayoral panel. And to begin, I get the honor, finally, after all these years, to introduce Jane Drow. Uh, I followed her around here and then down to Dallas and back to Oklahoma, and I finally get to introduce her. And as many of you know, Jane Drow was Miss America in 1967 and has had a distinguished career as a broadcast journalist media talent and producer, a 14-year veteran of primetime newscasts in Oklahoma and the Dallas-Fort Worth market, Jane Giroux was also the first spokesperson for the Oklahoma Health Center. In addition to producing and hosting several television projects related to health care, Jane Giroux is currently author of inspirational articles for both the print and audio industries. Her award-accumulating career has always involved many volunteer activities, recently being named the first female president of the Oklahoma Academy, a statewide nonpartisan organization that serves as a public policy think tank and catalyst for the state. Jane is married to Gerald Gamble and has one son, Tyler. Would you please join me in welcoming Jane Giroux? Thank you, Thank you, Paul. What a great morning. I certainly enjoyed uh, Mr. Crandall. I know all of you did as well. And I'm delighted to be a part of this conference. Now, how do we measure the characteristics that make a great city, a prosperous city, a city where companies want to move, a city where OU business graduates and other bright young men and women want to begin and end their career? There are a lot of different lists that I know we're familiar with that try to rank cities, and we know about them, and there are many criteria such as taxes, crime, education, culture. The lists are long, and the comparisons sometimes superficial. But one thing we can agree on this morning, and that is the importance of leadership. People with a vision, people with the people skills to be persuasive when necessary, people with integrity and credibility. People like the men and women you see sitting on this panel help create great cities. And that's why we're so honored today to have them with us to share their wisdom and experience. First from Santa Fe, New Mexico, Mayor Debbie Jaramillo. We'll just welcome her at this time. And in spite of an alleged rivalry with some university that is based in Austin, we do indeed welcome the mayor of Austin, Texas, Bruce Todd. <laughs> 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 
And some people say there's a rivalry between this city and Tulsa, but in a state this small, surely that is just a rumor. We're certainly thrilled to have with us the mayor of the beautiful city of Tulsa, Susan Savage. And what a lucky city Oklahoma City is to have a man with the stature and ability of a Ron Norick as mayor. This past year has certainly proved beyond any doubt how fortunate we are to have him in a leadership position. Ron Norick. <laughs> certainly want to thank you all for your public service and your time today. Now our format is very simple this morning. Each mayor will talk for about 10 minutes and then we'll entertain questions from you, the audience. Mayor Debbie Jaramillo is the first woman to be elected to the post of mayor in the history of the city of Santa Fe. Mayor Jaramillo is a lifelong Santa Fean. She served as city councilor in District 1 for six years. In March of 1994, she was elected mayor of the city of Santa Fe for a four-year term. Mayor Jaramillo prides herself in being a strong community activist. She is committed to making the city of Santa Fe affordable, livable, and peaceful. Thank you. Well, good morning, and today um, I've come to share a few things about my community. And which will include a little bit of history, a few statistics, and an overall vision. You know, I, I was telling some people earlier that I was feeling a little bit guilty to have to come and talk about the other side of the story because many people have visited Santa Fe, many people from all over the place, and talk about its beauty. And I'm not here to say that it does not have beauty because growing up there, I know it still has a lot to offer a lot of people. But I'm also here to speak a little bit about some of the problems we've faced economically that are worthwhile sharing because I think that it will help others who may envision focusing on perhaps tourism uh, realize that there can be problems along the way and maybe uh, what I have to say and share with you will help you realize as, as individuals that um, there's a good and the bad side to everything, and uh, maybe we can all learn from some of our own personal experiences. But let me start by giving you my bottom line first. And that can be simply stated by saying that if we look at the big picture, we must look at the symptoms of a society that is in deep stress and start dealing with the causes. Um, you know, we continue to see like rising crime, homelessness, hunger, poverty, uh, apathy and withdrawal, polarization between races and classes. These are symptoms. These are symptoms of a society in deep stress and treating symptoms does not alleviate the stress. In Santa Fe, we have a history, a history of almost 400 years of people coming to visit our community because of what we created there. And what we created was a diverse group of people living in harmony, uh, learning from each other, and pretty much just trying to get along. And that mainly included the Native American people, the Hispanic people, and the Anglo population. And a lot of the change that has occurred over the hundreds of years has been more good than bad. But in the last decade, we've had many problems because of a fast-paced change in terms of what a small community may usually experience. But again, going back to the bigger picture, one of the problems we're facing and having to deal with today are things like problems with economic class, which I think is just a fact of American history, but it's also of human history also. And that is that we have income and wealth and ownership in America as we do in all our communities and in Santa Fe what happened in the last decade was we had an overabundance of that wealth and income and prosperity and while one end of the spectrum was prospering the other end seemed to fall behind and that I'm telling you is the difference and the spread between the newcomers that were coming and the old timers that have been there for many generations in our community. I want to tell you that um, we all 
may have felt it or understood that there's a justified distrust of government. But in Santa Fe, we've been fortunate over the years to build a base of government that is working cohesively with our business sector, our nonprofits, uh, even our philanthropic organizations. And we have been fortunate to pull, um, I guess, an organization of sorts or partnership that has, is helping us realize the problems that we face as a community today after much, much change over the years. You know, I think that the traditional liberal approach to dealing with our problems is to look at people and say, uh, perhaps if we have nutritional problems, offer people food stamps. Or if we look at people who have housing problems, offer them a housing program. Or if we look at elderly people who are having health problems, uh, offer them Medicare, but I think overall what people lack most is just something called plain old money. And we can buy things like health and housing and education and even some dignity for that matter if we have money. You know, I know that uh, it's not a secret that many of us in America are facing problems and we look at the country as a whole or the world as a whole and we hear about them on a daily basis. If we look at what the economists say, we can look at many of the uh, places where prosperity is of, of uh, priority and is, is, it stands out more. But if we look at, for example, some of the economic problems we face worldwide, we can look at things like uh, layoffs today. Uh, recently in the northern part of our state, we had a big layoff situation in our Los Alamos National Laboratories. And layoffs, as we see it, are not necessarily temporary as they have been in the past. It is permanent downsizing many times of companies and transfers of jobs to plants in other countries by these multinational corporations. In Los Alamos, actually most of those jobs are filled by the northern part of our community, but come uh, out of the University of California. We are having to deal with a major layoff in the northern part of our state that spreads into our community, Santa Fe, and many other northern communities. But maybe we can look at Santa Fe to see a way to the future, even though it sounds somewhat uh, out of reach. Because let me paint you a picture of what happened in the past decade. After a good 10, 15 years of promoting more and more tourism, what we have today is that home prices have gone up over three times as fast as income. Over 75% of our population can no longer afford a median priced home, and Santa Fe's cost of living index is 12% above the national average, while housing costs are 37% higher. Wage scales are at the bottom 10% of the national average, and I live in a city where about 40% of the population cannot afford a median rental cost and most apartment rentals are more than $600 a month. Uh, Santa Fe is losing its middle class by about 2% a year, and the ownership rate is also dropping by 2% per year in home ownership. There has been an 8% increase in housing costs every year since 1975. In summary, in 10 years since Santa Fe became the darling of the national press, our cost of living has skyrocketed and our wages have remained stagnant. But let me tell you what we're doing today because I happen to be one of those mayors who spoke to these issues and said, we have had prosperity, we can continue to have it, but we need to be careful about what we're losing because tourism has been one of our main industries and tourism has been with us for almost 400 years, and we need to have a place that people still enjoy visiting. So because of that, I made affordable housing and economic development issues the number one priority of my administration. Now the housing picture is turning around now, and it is one of the great stories of my administration. There are fine examples of how business, the nonprofits, philanthropic organizations, and our city government are working cooperatively and energetically for the public good. You know, just in the last two years since I was elected mayor, we have several programs going. And there are examples that include a small business development program, which is a loan program which provides financial assistance in the form of a guarantee for a direct bank loan to residents who have an existing small business or who are interested in starting a business. Now priority is given to minority owned businesses 
and to people of low and moderate income. It is an effort to build up the bottom part of the scale where much had been lost over the last 10, 15, maybe even 20 years. We have a business incubator, which is expected to improve the survival rate of the new businesses in their critical startup years. And it's also to provide business training and assistance. This facility will offer office space, shared utility conference and support uh, space, and some space for light manufacturing or architectural design work. And uh, this work has begun pretty much, and we expect this facility to be operational by early 1997. We have an airport industrial park that we are developing, and it's, again, a, an area to provide affordable space for industrial activities, including manufacturing and, and the business and distribution facilities. It is also intended to provide space for expanding companies such as the incubator graduates. Um, we also are working up an industri industrial revenue bond ordinance, which is intended for manufacturing facilities, which will provide financial benefits to companies through lower financing costs for planned construction or expansion. Uh, also, it will allow for tax relief in the form of gross receipts and property taxes on these new facilities and the equipment that they build or acquire with the bond proceeds. We've also implemented an apprenticeship program, which is to improve opportunities for our youth. Uh, we are in the process of creating an organization to promote and facilitate the apprenticeships and to develop a strategic plan to guide its operation. Uh, we are working with our community college, the Chamber of Commerce, the public schools, city government, and pulling a partnership to address how we can get the apprenticeship program moving. And we have, lastly, the recent purchase of our rail yard property. It, was, it is almost 50 acres of property in the downtown area. We have purchased this property at the city with the intentions of having a community public process to determine the uses. This is after eight years of the community saying we don't want more hotels, we don't want more galleries, we don't want all these things. And so we figured that the only way to control the use was to have ownership of it. We will be working with our community for the next year to determine what public uses will go in there alongside the open space. But in summary, I can tell you that the vision for Santa Fe's development is one which we can achieve what I call optimum self-reliance. My goal is to promote an economy which is diverse, balanced, and perhaps even a little innovative. It's important that we have, as a community, a sense of control over our natural, human, and physical resources. This is the only way we can promote this philosophy of self-help and self-development. Santa Fe's 400 years of history is important to all of us in our community. It is important in terms of how we can maintain perhaps another 400 years of history at the same time protecting the natural beauty that many people come to see the diversity that many people come to integrate with and to overall protect an economy and a people that has, I guess, proven, has a proven record of working well. However, for the last decade, we have a proven record that we have made mistakes along the way and we still have time to correct them. I like when people tell me, I love your city, we love to visit regularly, or I visit your city for the first time and it's a beautiful place. I, as mayor, like to hear those things, but I, as mayor, believe, too, that the people who live there want to feel good about their community, too, and so it becomes a very crucial balancing act, a very difficult situation to deal with, but I think that our problems are known nationally. I know that I try to speak to them as much as I can nationally so that other communities can learn how we dealt with them, maybe perhaps how we resolved them and how we can provide a better future, not only for our community, but for many other communities who face many similar problems as we do in Santa Fe. Thank you. I want to remind you that you have uh, cards on your chairs, and if you have questions for any of the mayors, we'll be trying to get to those. So if you fill those out and hold them up, someone will pick them up. So as uh, we're going through this morning, please feel free to 
<clears throat> write down your questions. Prior to being elected mayor in 1991, Bruce Todd was a county commissioner in Travis County for several years. Mayor Todd is a CPA by profession and has a long list of volunteer activities. He's been very active in national and state organizations that affect the management of cities, such as chairing several committees at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Please welcome Mayor Bruce Todd of Austin, Texas. Well, thank you very much, Jane. Let me uh, start out with a confession. Uh, the confession is I am ill-prepared uh, for this discussion today, not because I don't know what I'm going to say. I've got that all written down, but I was expecting to come up here to do one of two things, either to boast about the game last Saturday or to eat crow, one of the two. Little did I expect a, a tie. Um, I've been asked about 10 times since arrival at 9.30 last night why we chose to run a play as opposed to a field goal with eight minutes left in the game. The only excuse I have is our coach must have thought it was already 1996 and this was indeed a conference game. I realize that excuse is a little lame, but no lamer than the play itself. It was fascinating uh, to hear Debbie talk about Santa Fe and some of the issues that uh, plague her city and plague all cities uh, as we deal with this issue of success and growth. And I enjoyed learning from her, as we do from other mayors, about what we can take back to our communities as a result of these kinds of conferences. Uh, now, you are all aware of Texans, and, and Texas mayors are fond of boasting. And we're fond of saying that um, we have we govern the best city in the entire United States. Uh, and the only difference between our saying that and other mayors saying that is that we're right. But you will find that necessary pride, uh, that necessary uh, social and civic uh, responsibility in mayors to carry them through the day to deal with some of the very tough issues. Now, this conference is about economic development. In Austin, we talk about quality of life, and we talk about the trees, we talk about the water, we talk about all those kinds of things that make Austin, in our opinion, a very special and unique place to grow. And indeed, those are uh, great attributes of quality of life. Uh, but I would maintain that quality of life starts with, starts with holding a job and the ability to afford the things in life that others around us have and to make sure our cities develop not as a place of haves and have-nots, but places where people in all income and socioeconomic backgrounds are able to succeed and have the promise of a bright future. That is what drives me. That is what drives you as individuals. And I would submit to you that that is what drives a great city, the opportunity and hope for the ability to make money, to provide for one's family, and to economically prosper in the city in which they live. Now, Austin has done very well. We were recently uh, recognized as being the 23rd largest city in the United States. We, last year, uh, ex encouraged 24 of our companies to expand, uh, creating uh, over 3,000 jobs, and 32 new companies to move to Austin, significant new companies to move to Austin, uh, creating another 2,800 jobs. But in 1995 and 96, the projection is that with those companies expanding and new companies, as well as the normal business growth of the smaller companies, we will create more than 52,000 jobs with a growth rate of around 6.1% in job creation, meaning we're suffering perhaps in another way, but we're suffering from the same thing that uh, Santa Fe and other cities are growing as we develop. Uh, we are becoming a high-tech mecca in Austin, uh, and we are finding that that has served us very well. Whether it was IBM or Motorola starting there some 25 years ago, or a company like Samsung who is establishing its first manufacturing plant uh, in the United States, uh, and that will bring an investment of about $1.4 billion and about 1,600 jobs when that is created, and through the 10-year history, we'll have an investment of about $1.4 Five or $4.5 billion. Uh, this year alone, I will do two uh, dedications, one of which I've already done, that in Mot at Motorola, and will be followed by an AMD dedication. Each one of those buildings is valued in excess of $1 billion. Now, the question I have to ask myself, and I think we all have to ask, is what 
what attributes do companies look at, be they small, be they large, be they high tech, be they manufacturing, that will cause them to locate in your city and to provide for economic development. In attracting Samsung, we ask them the same question. What is it you are looking for? What is it that you hold up on your list of criteria to help you make a decision uh, that will help us as we talk to you and as we respond to your various needs? And they answered, I think, with great frankness in terms of their decision-making process and what they look at. Now, they may be a very large company and have some different reasons because of their high-tech nature and because of the fact that they're a foreign corporation, but I think that there are some stories that we can take out from their discussions with us. They listed, they listed the first reason, the, the most important reason in terms of valuation they had for location. And it was not tax abatements, although those were offered. It was not quality of life in terms of the trees and all those kinds of things, which we think are important to them and certainly to us. But in terms of their business decision, it was job training. Job training. Job training. Making certain that the resources that they're going to need to produce products to be competitive in the future, making sure those employees would be in place. It is estimated in Texas, and I think this is probably true of Oklahoma and almost every state in the nation, that by the year 2000, only 15% of the jobs will require, will actually require college education. But the remainder of those 85% of the jobs will require advanced training in excess of a high school degree. Now, as a uh, proud uh, University of Texas uh, alumni, and I know there's some folks uh, from a proud university up north of the Red River up here, we tend to think that we have the key to future success. But the truth is, future success for many, many people, a majority, will not just be a college education, it will be making sure that specific training is in place to qualify those people for a job. In fact, you may find that people may have a college degree and that may not be sufficient to get them into one of the technically trained jobs or technically required jobs that are available in the high-tech industry, and for that matter, in the manufacturing industry or any other uh, industry you might, uh, you might profess. It is said that in Austin, because of the fact that we have over one out of five people will be enrolled in university uh, uh, climate in Austin, Texas, that you're as likely to find someone with a Ph.D. Waiting, waiting on you at a table at a restaurant as you'll find someone with only a high school degree. But the truth is that focus on proper training is going to be, I think, the biggest advantage that any community will be able to offer in the future as they go about trying to lure businesses to their city. Not a place where they have to come and recreate training, not a place where they have to pay millions of dollars or thousands of dollars, certainly, to be able to train folks to hold the jobs, but that they can hire today and go immediately into the workplace with a minimum of orientation. Some of the other issues that were listed, obviously cost of doing business was the second one, uh, and one that's important, and each city is going to have a different dynamic about that. The third criteria, which relates to the first, was education in general. Most companies, when they exercise and make their decisions about where to locate, are as concerned with that employee base and the benefits to be offered to their employees who are usually of childbearing age and years and have children at home as any other decision they look at. They want to make sure that they don't have to say, you may come to Austin, Texas, but our school system is rotten and you'll have to put them in a private school and pay $10,000 a year to do so. They want to hear that they can have a socially, racially, culturally diverse and excellent school system in which to, to, for which to send their kids, because that ingredient is going to be absolutely essential as we try to attract people to our city. If we're a city that has short changed its general education, public education system, we're going to find our ability and your ability to attract employers to be very, very difficult. The last two issues involve issues important to the high-tech community, obviously fast-tracking their projects, making sure that they can get into our community or they can expand in our community, still meet all the rules, but do it in the minimum amount of time and expense that they can possibly incur. And the last they would list is the social climate. Again, back to employees 
And Bob Crandall referred to that to some extent this morning, I think honestly. He said he was. Uh, and that is the fact that the social fabric and the importance of that to their employees is a major reason people locate in communities. Companies will not come to a community if they believe that their employees will not be accepted, uh, be they employees that they hire locally or that they import. They're going to want to make sure that those people can join your community, can be part of the PTA, can be part of the adoptive school programs, can be part of, of all the other fabric of your community um, that, um, that you could possibly imagine. And I will close by saying this. <clears throat> One of the greatest assets I think we have in Austin, and I think that cities ought to pride themselves on, is their attention to this issue of bringing up children in their community, children to work with the employers who are mo moving there today to be able to have jobs in the morning and therefore have that hope and opportunity that is so desperately needed. We hold an annual meeting of our adopt -a school program. It is held in the Irwin Center which is the basketball arena that President Clinton spoke uh, in two days ago. And it was held there because it's the only facility that we have in town that on the floor, on the floor can seat and feed more than 5,000 people. 5,000 people showing up on one night just to celebrate our commitment to education and to the children and their opportunities for tomorrow. If there is a message I have learned as mayor, it is paying attention, not just to today or looking to the past, but looking to the future. And I think that making sure that our children are able to prosper is as much a part of economic development as any other economic development tool your city council, your state, or your civic community can put together. And I would encourage all people to do it. It has worked for us, and I think it will work around this nation. Thank you very much. M. Susan Savage was elected mayor of her native city in 1992, then re-elected in 1994. Prior to her work at City Hall, Savage served 10 years as executive director of the Metropolitan Tulsa Citizens Crime Commission. Her undergraduate degree is in criminal justice and economics, and she has studied and worked with courts and prison systems in the United States and England. Please welcome Mayor Susan Savage. Thank you, Jane. This is uh, really a pleasure to be here, and I, as I've listened to Debbie and Bruce speak, and, and usually mayors refer to one another in a little more formal terms, but um, certainly I feel it's almost like coming home. I have spent um, probably as much time in the city of Santa Fe and in northern New Mexico as I have uh, vacationing in the state of Oklahoma. My uh, family, I have a lot of family who lives in Austin, Texas. My brother is the general manager of the newspaper there and serves on the Economic Development Commission of the Chamber of Commerce and works with uh, Bruce Todd on a regular basis. So I get all the inside scoop about what's really going on in Austin. And then, of course, uh, Ron Norick is um, not only our Tulsa and Oklahoma City sister cities, and we share a lot of the common goals, but I always encourage Ron to come and to visit and to learn from the great state of Tulsa. But I'm delighted to be, Ron, in your city. Let me begin and, uh, by sharing with you some of the, the unique characteristics that give Tulsa such um, a flavor and warmth of being such a strong community in which to do business and a, such a terrific place in which to live. Our city is a city of 375,000 people in a metropolitan area of roughly 700,000. As chief executive for the city of Tulsa, our city charter grants to the mayor very broad executive authority. We have a $385 million annual budget. We employ more than 4,000 people. We're supported primarily by uh, sales tax, three cents sales tax, one cent of which is dedicated solely to capital improvements. The other revenue sources include user fees, primarily assessed for our utilities, water, sewer, stormwater, solid waste. We are one of our city's largest employers and certainly one of the most diverse. We do everything from operate an animal shelter, uh, undertake financial investments, provide police and fire services, make available clean, safe drinking water, run a museum, a municipal court, a nationally recognized floodplain management system, a zoo, a park system, street construction, the list goes on and on. 
all of those activities relate to economic development, which, as you've heard from um, Santa Fe and Austin, are essential to any city's job, any city mayor's job. Through public works projects, public safety initiatives, zoning decisions and policies that are set in a community, job training, the building permit process and the delivery of water, sewer, and stormwater services, local government, the policies of local government, the practices of local government directly impact the overall health of an economy. In fact, the city of Tulsa is one of the largest developers in our community with anywhere from $200 million to $250 million in infrastructure projects underway in any given day, week, or month. Since the 1980s, we have effectively managed more than $1.2 billion in capital improvements. Those have been funded locally through bond issues and, again, through our third penny for sales tax. We feel this progressive approach to being a community that works to solve its own problems has enabled us to make great, great strides in job retention and job expansion, especially in light of certainly the, the many challenges our city, Oklahoma City, and, and our entire state has faced since the early 80s. Earlier this year, I was fortunate enough to participate in the official ceremonies marketing, marking the opening of Amico's Financial Services Center. Now, for those of you who may not have followed that competition, for mayors who are seeking to undertake business expansion, or in this case, this was retention and expansion, it became a highly competitive situation. Competition that came down to Tulsa, New Orleans, and Cincinnati. A competition that we won not just because of financial incentives, which became part of the scenario and become part of a community's competitive process, but because of our quality of life, which includes everything from a declining crime rate to our excellent cultural facilities. In that specific example, it meant the retention of 450 financial jobs that would have left Tulsa had we not been successful in our efforts. It meant the addition of more than 700 new jobs made, it, made up of local hires, and Amico employees who will transfer to Tulsa from other accounting and finance centers that are being consolidated to Tulsa. So as businesses, as businesses make important decisions about streamlining, consolidating, re-engineering, whatever the, the current parlance is, the impact on local communities is tremendous. That announcement came on the heels of Central and Southwest Corporation moving 600 jobs to Tulsa from Dallas. Whirlpool's 1,300 plus manufacturing jobs, which our community passed a one half cent sales tax countywide to provide $26 million to finance the construction of a $100 million facility for Whirlpool. And the retention and growth of Rockwell International made last year a very exciting one. And that has continued uh, through this year. In April, we got the good news from Wiltel, now known as WorldCom Telecommunications. They would add several hundred new jobs. The post office has announced expansion plans and most recently First Data Corporation announced plans to add an additional 3,000 jobs to their current 1,000 plus payroll in Tulsa. And so we're proud of the fact that following a tremendous decline in the 80s, we have diversified and we have grown and we have recovered. And in large part, these big announcements I think sometimes uh, detract from the fact that so much of our business growth and business health in Tulsa is fueled by small and existing businesses. Recently released statistics show that in 1994, businesses with fewer than 100 employees added more than 11,000 jobs in the Tulsa metropolitan area. So small business remains the backbone of our economic vitality. There are lots of challenges for communities, and you've heard several of them mentioned here. I want to maybe touch upon a few others. The challenges to any community to remain vibrant and dynamic require us to form partnerships, maybe partnerships. Certainly you hear public-private partnerships, and in, in Tulsa that is not only a tradition, but it really is um, a practice that has been long-standing and one that works very, very well for us. But partnerships will have to come 
in new forms and in new ways because with cutbacks in services at the federal and the state levels, local communities will increasingly be asked to fill those service gaps. No community will be able to do it alone. We will have to look for ways to work with businesses that perhaps are unprecedented. Essential to our ability to do this will be the strength of our education systems. And I agree with Mayor Todd that you have to look beyond just job training and look at education, your overall education systems as well, beginning with common education, bringing into that higher education and certainly vocational training. One of the most significant tools we have in this state is a vocational educational system that was begun 30 years ago and has really attained national status as one of the premier systems in the country. Every time I speak with company executives who are seeking to expand locally or to bring work into our community, training is an issue. And when we have as a tool the ability to say, what are your training needs? Let us design and develop through our vocational system whatever your needs may be. It's a huge asset and one in which, um, as a state, because we have chosen to make that investment, has served us very well. Last week, all of the communities surrounding Tulsa, the suburban communities, approved bond issues for their public school systems. A very, very strong statement of support. Tulsa Public Schools, which is one of the largest public school districts in the nation, will hold a bond election next month, which for those of you who live and work in our state, you know it requires a supermajority of 60% in order to pass a bond issue, so you start almost at a disadvantage when you begin to deal uh, with asking people to raise their taxes. But these improvements are essential. Not only will they provide programmatic needs to ensure that children receive the skills that they must have in order to compete, but it will improve facilities and expand technology. These community-wide investments, community-wide initiatives, are investments in the future, ensuring that those who enter and move through our workforce will have the skills necessary and the advanced training available to do the job, to have the skills, and to have the knowledge in an increasingly complicated and certainly an increasingly global economy. Perhaps, and I, I will digress here a moment to a, 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 a statewide issue, but I think the most serious challenge that this state has faced in a long time in terms of its future growth and vitality is um, the possible passage of state question 669. I view, um, I'm strongly opposed to it and view that in the event that we approve that as a state, that we in effect shorten our life and ensure that the investment that we have seen and the growth that we have seen in our educational systems will no longer continue. Also essential to raising the standard of living in a community and for our citizens is the quality of life in any community. Amico's deciding factor when it came down to making the decision about where they would go was because Tulsa had a high quality of life. Tulsa was a community that really cared about itself. Tulsa citizens really wanted to be members of the community. And for the business who was seeking to be a partner with the community, that became an important variable. In our city, crime is down for the third consecutive year. All categories of violent crime showed a decrease in 1994 compared to previous years, and it looks as though that trend will continue through this year. The cost of living in Tulsa is 89% of the national average, and housing prices in Tulsa remain some of the most competitive nationwide. Tulsa's unemployment rate has dipped to th or dipped to 3.9% in July, the lowest it has been since the days of the oil boom. In fact, employment is so strong in our community that it is outstripping the labor force, creating new challenges for us, ensuring that we must continue to develop skill sets among our, our students and our young workers to ensure that they have a place in this growing labor force. Transportation networks provide important links for Tulsa to be a major distribution center. Tulsa's 
Port of Catoosa, which is the inlandmost water port in this country, continues to show substantial increases in barge traffic, and business at the port employs more than 1,500 people. Regeneration of declining neighborhoods in and around our central business district, our downtown Tulsa, is occurring. It's been a slow process. It will not happen quickly, but there is a renewed commitment to ensuring that we don't allow decay to become pervasive among our older neighborhoods. We already have made the investment in our infrastructure. We already have the services going to those neighborhoods. Uh, to allow them to decline threatens the stability of our tax base. It is an investment for the vitality and health of a city to ensure that we regenerate those neighborhoods facing special problems. And with Tulsa's long tradition of supporting the arts, from a regional ballet company and, and regional opera company to our unparalleled collection of Western and Indian art in our city-owned Gilchrist Museum, our city values and supports artistic expression, which enhances our ability to um, present ourselves as a community. Quality of life and economic growth are intertwined and as Tulsa continues to be one of America's most progressive communities, a city of choice where people really decide they want to live and to work, where economic vitality is generated from public and private partnerships, we believe a strong commitment to prosperity is one that will serve us well in the future. Thank you. Mayor Ron Norick was first elected in 1987 and is serving his third term today. Certainly one of his proudest accomplishments has to be the passage of MAPS, a proposal to build and renovate $280 million in facilities in Oklahoma City. His list of accomplishments are many, as are his volunteer involvements. Please welcome the mayor of Oklahoma City, Ron Norick. Good morning. It's nice to welcome all my fellow mayors, too, to our city, and I hope that you have a pleasant stay while you're here and have a chance to see a little bit of our community. I've been in all of your communities and uh, have enjoyed them very much. Uh, the way I look at interest, the way I've looked at economic development uh, for the years, and as uh, Jane said, I've been in office since 1987, and as most of you know, I came out of the business community and came out of an industry that was capital intensive, and that was in the printing industry, that we had to spend a lot of money on um, equipment, and we had to plan it uh, sometimes years in advance because of the production schedules that we required as well as the manufacturing of the equipment. So when I came into office in 1987, uh, as Susan has alluded to, the uh, 80s were not kind to Oklahoma, and they weren't kind to Texas and a lot of other markets uh, in our area and we were really trying to recover as much as we were trying to do anything to get back to maybe where we were sometime earlier. Back in 1987 I started looking at what uh, we really need to do from a city perspective to really get our city going and one of the first things that I was very concerned about was infrastructure and I started looking and the last major bond issue that had been passed by this community was in 1976. There were a couple small ones, but uh, very small in size that had been passed in, uh, in the early 80s. But essentially, uh, as all mayors know, and I think anybody in the business community knows, that if you don't invest in your future and you don't invest in the, the infrastructure of your, of your community or your businesses, at some time it gets to be worse, so, so expensive you can't do anything about it. And that's really what we started looking at. So the, my first job was, as I felt like, was to try to develop some sort of goals for the city in the way of infrastructure improvement and capital programs. Another thing that I noticed is that we didn't even have a capital program. We had no long-term capital program in the city. We basically funded our long-term capital by whatever was left over in the budget that particular year. And as all of you know, working uh, in the business community or the university, wherever it is, if that's the way you look at what you do capital-wise, most of the time you don't get to do a lot because you're using it all in dealing with the operational needs and cost of a particular situation. So we developed a five-year capital plan, a rolling plan that was introduced and approved by council in uh, 1988. Uh, that plan continues today. Uh, it is now set at a little over a billion dollars, of which uh, almost 700 million of it is funded to date at this time. 
and that's something that I think we can that will, will allow our community to continue for years to come and would encourage future councils to make sure that they do that. Also looked at the infrastructure. Like I said, we hadn't passed any major bond issues since 76, so we drafted and put together a, a bond issue and sent it to the voters in 1989, $153 million, which was far in excess of anything that we had ever asked the voters of this community. Uh, but convinced them that they needed to prepare for the future, and the only way to do that was to allocate the dollars to do that. We were successful in getting that issue passed in 89, and as you know that are here from the central area or Oklahoma City, you know we're in the process of now going to the voters December of this year and asking for $220 million infrastructure for our community, which will carry us through the year 2002. I've always been one that it's a lot cheaper to repair it now rather than have to rebuild it later, and I think that's vitally important. Also during this, this time frame, we got in the middle of what was known uh, then and still is, is uh, dealing with United Airlines. And as Susan has said and several and Bruce, that when it gets time to start dealing with these various companies, it almost gets to be a bidding war. And I think us as mayors wish we could say time out and let's all just go on what our communities have to offer. But unfortunately, that's not the way the, the game is played. Although I think it has slowed down quite a bit as to the tax incentives and all that. And I agree 100 percent that education and workforce are the two key areas that, that companies look at. We made a very strong effort for that particular plant. And as you recall, we passed a, a one cent sales tax for three years to help them fund about $200 million worth of improvements that our community was willing to pay, did a number of things, and got right down to the end, right down to the end, and came out number two. And I know that our proposal was every bit as good as Indianapolis. And it took some time for me to really realize what had happened, but uh, about a year later, I was thinking about that, been thinking about it a lot up to that year also, but I'd been thinking about it, and decided that really, Indianapolis or United Airlines made the right choice in, in going to Indianapolis as opposed to Oklahoma City. And the reason was this issue that we might call quality of life. And I got to looking at what we had here in Oklahoma City and how we'd prepared ourselves and said, I'm the executive, the top man at United Airlines, and I'm going to look at what I can offer my employees to either relocate or stay in either Indianapolis or Oklahoma City. Where would you want them? I'll have to admit, I think Indianapolis had more to offer in the way of quality of life, sports teams, or whatever it might be, education system, and we were falling behind. So that's when I decided that we had really have got to do something. If we're going to go become major players in the employment market, we've got to have that base, that infrastructure. It can be education or whatever you want to call it, but it's still the same, and we must get out and do something about it. So we started a number of programs. One of them was the 23rd Street the ULI study which is a corridor for the visiting mayors that is really was the, the old retail district of this community. And it is not very far north, just about two miles from here, and our community goes many miles to the north, so it's almost a uh, central city, is to get that area back into a vital and vibrant retail district. It's right by some of our, one of our wonderful universities here, Oklahoma City University. And we have finished that study. ULI came in here, and we're in the process of making improvements. Uh, the merchants associations have formed groups, and they're putting money back in their businesses and back in their areas to really develop that area. So we've got that little piece going. We uh, also work with the Stockyards Group, which is another area here in town that, is a, that has a lot of history in this community. And the same thing there, that, that business community came to us and said, uh, we would like to do something about our community as a selling, as the city willing to help. I said, most certainly we are. So we have done uh, what's called the Main Street program with that group for a number of years. And we're doing the same thing with the Northeast Corridor now, Lincoln Boulevard, and a number of things to get those area going. And then uh, just a couple years ago, uh, the, the citizens of our community passed uh, what I think is a revolutionary uh, sales tax to build what's called MAPS. And that all started about in 1991 when I started putting teams of people together in different groups to look at the sports, look at the educational needs, look at the cultural needs of our community to try to put something together so that the next time that we had an opportunity to maybe look at a United or whomever it was, that we wouldn't have to take back seat to anybody, that we would be uh, right up there with the best of them. 
we uh, are in the process, and this is probably more for the, the visiting mayors, and a lot of you all know a lot about this anyway, but we just broke ground on uh, a new ballpark down the street uh, last week that will house our new, uh, well, not our new ball team, but the 89ers who have been here for many, many years. It's uh, affiliated with the Texas Rangers. So, see, we get along with Texas occasionally, so that's okay. We've, we really appreciate uh, that. Uh, we also are in the process of adding $30 million to this facility to be a world-class convention facility, uh, to also build a ballroom that uh, will feed uh, 2,500 people, which this community needs uh, very badly. We also are going to build a new sports complex, 20,000 seat right to the south of this building. And then uh, not to say that everything is sports related, but then right up the street we'll be building a new library adult education center that will be used to uh, help the future education of business people who are in our community that might like to continue their ed education in the evening, be able to stay here and be able to do that with our system. And going a little farther uh, to the west, our Civic Center Music Hall, which is a great performing arts theater that was built, uh, WPA funds in 1937, and we're spending a little over $30 million renovation there. Not to mention the canal that uh, something like to your neighbor of the south, San Antonio, uh, will be in here as well as the river project, transportation link, and a lot of improvements at the fairgrounds. And what that's all about is trying to make sure that our community has the things to offer our citizens that are here so that as everybody's talked about, uh, that our kids will stay here, we'll be able to find jobs, we'll be able to educate uh, their kids and stay for years to come. I have uh, two grown children and two uh, grandchildren that are coming up. And obviously, I would love to see them stay here, and right now they are. Uh, but the opportunities must be here if they're going to stay in the community, and that's what economic development's all about. And when you get down to economic development, the city is probably the key role in any of that. The chambers are the ones that go out and have to really put a lot of those deals together. But if the cities and the citizens of those communities have not spent the time, the effort, and the money to make sure that their community is, is of that type structure, then the chambers cannot do anything. They're fighting an uphill battle. So I'm very pleased with our community. Uh, they have been very supportive of what we've done the last several years. Uh, I anticipate that they'll approve this bond issue again uh, because I think they are willing to, to, to vote and, and to spend toward the future, and that's what it's all about, to develop our future. And I think that it's vitally important that we do that. And I, again, uh, commend the uh, University of Oklahoma for the conference. This is the second time I participate. I think it's an excellent idea, and I also welcome my uh, fellow mayors from around the country. We have an opportunity in case to see each other at various conferences. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have a great deal of time for your questions, but we do want to entertain them. And while I'm receiving them, let me go ahead and ask a question of Mayor Todd. Uh, the Austin area has been considered one of three high-tech areas of the country, along with the area just south of San Francisco and the Boston area. How do you think this phenomenon occurred, and what can other areas do to attract high-tech business? Mayor Todd. Well, I think that it occurred, uh, obviously, because, in some part, uh, large part because of the University of Texas. Uh, I think a university setting uh, is absolutely essential uh, if you're going to have a high-tech uh, community. Uh, they provide engineers, they provide the chemist, uh, they provide all those kinds of things that are so terribly uh, necessary. Um, so I think that the educational, uh, back again to the educational system, I think that it must be in place if your aspirations are to develop in the high-tech area. Um, I think that beyond that, though, the issue of a community being supportive uh, in terms of the way it provides employees uh, to those individuals or those individual companies is, is, is critical also. Making certain high tech tends to develop a, uh, on a synergy basis with other suppliers, uh, and that's the way most of the growth occurs. The, the, the lesser employees uh, become the major employers, and the, the, uh, in terms of numbers, your, your, your greatest numbers come from the supply services, um, the support services to those major companies. Uh, and making sure there's a business climate for them to prosper is absolutely critical. Um, the job training issue I mentioned in the comments, of course, uh, essential to that development. Thank you. Mayor Savage, what practical steps have been, uh, proactive steps, has Tulsa taken toward crime control? Oh, a bunch. Um, I would have to say part of our, part of our um, success in bringing the crime rate down has been um, 
really threefold. One has been a very strategic and very targeted effort in enforcement. Uh, we have undertaken with uh, some police who have just gone out on the streets recently from graduating from the academy. They were, they were the first round of cops on the beat money that came from the federal government. Those officers are part of a, a strategic neighborhood patrol who uh, will go into areas where they're experiencing specific problems, drug problems, prostitution, um, auto thefts, work for a period of time and then move on. The second thing that we've worked very hard to address in a, in a more comprehensive way is family violence. Uh, we Typically it's been called domestic violence, but we found about two years ago that most of our homicides were related to a situation occurring in the home where the people were known to one another and generally related. Obviously that has an impact uh, that extends far beyond just the two individuals who might be involved in the altercation. And so we have um, put into place in our police department a family violence unit. We have brought together the courts, the prosecution, um, all of our service delivery networks, the education system, the religious services, uh, social services, the business community to develop a very comprehensive way to approach family violence. We've been responsible in this past year for getting legislation through the state legislature that provides greater penalties for those who, who commit acts of violence in a, in a domestic situation. So that has been very, very important. The third component has been a, a strong partnership formed with neighborhood associations. We have over 250 neighborhood associations within the city of Tulsa. We have an office for neighborhoods that is located in, in, uh, in the mayor's office. And working with um, nonprofit groups and our neighborhood associations, we try to address the reasons that crime occurs at as close to the grassroots level as we can. And that forms, that means partnerships between the police and those citizens. It means bringing resources in a com into the community. And uh, it means really looking beyond just having a certain number of police officers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Jaramillo, what industries are the economic base of Santa Fe and what new industries are coming in? Our industry consists primarily of tourism and government jobs. And uh, it's been very difficult for the city of Santa Fe to focus on attracting business because we have these uh, typical problems of the high cost of living, an uneducated workforce of sorts, um, you know, just the, the cost of land and the taxation that goes with it. And unfortunately, we have state laws. We are a municipality that does not or is governed by uh, state laws, and, and our state laws are still very much antiquated in terms of incentives that we can offer for any business that would like to come into our community. So um, with those limitations, it's been difficult to focus on that. And so what we've concentrated m mostly on, at least during my tenure on the city council and now as mayor, has been to grow from within. And it's pretty much to support our small businesses in the form of uh, any help we can give for expansions, retentions, or building the small business base. And even at that with that in mind, it has been difficult because now we are faced with the cutbacks that we have somewhat relied on the federal government to help us with, and so now we're going to have to pick the tab up on that. But fortunately, we've had a good economic base over the years that has, uh, I think, uh, provided the opportunities we've needed to look at any form of expansion. But with tourism and government having been the focus for all these years, it was time to start talking about diversification, but became a difficult situation when we thought about what could we attract being such a small community uh, and what were the problems these businesses may face if they come to our town and better yet, how could we grow from within uh, with the limited programs we had. So we focused on, on um, tourism much too much over the years, but now we put our energies into the small business sector and as one mayor said earlier, you know, that being the backbone, I think, of any community, we expect.